thank you all for being here. I want to introduce the other two talented gentlemen who are up here on this stage with me on guitar, Mr. Brady Harris. <laughs> Boise's own Mr. Todd Chavez on drums. All right, now is the time when I need your help in welcoming back to the BCT stage one of my very favorites, Lauren Weedman. <laughs> Technical difficulties, oh my god, I'm so turned on already. I've been in and out of every honky tonk in town. I'm almost drunk for the drinks that I turned down. Well, he told me I'd be happy, bounce babies on my knees. While I sit at home alone, and I've been bouncing through. Yeah, I'm tired of two. Oh, 
then the, the more she you know, licked her rice cracker, the more the hungrier I got. I was like, yeah. She had a, were very different types of ladies. And as uh, and she was so concerned about uh, when I turned 13, when I started running through puberty and my uh, body changed, you know, like it happens to girls because girls are so gross. Anyway, <laughs> and um, I'm just kidding. I, um, anyway, so I, I, my body started changing and that was disturbing for her because I was like busting out of my, my, I was literally like, that's how I knew I was gaining weight actually, is that I, like, I heard a button pop off. I was like, like, <laughs> <laughs> was, like, like, my, like my, busting out of my clothes. My mother was so um, uh, petrified, I think, on my behalf. She, set, she signed me up for uh, Weight Watchers and Nutrisystem, and I went to um, a hypnotist, it's like a version therapy thing, where the guy would like talk me through these visualizations of, you know, you're, you're walking on the beach, you see a, a beautiful lady in a bikini, and she offers you uh, a donut, but she throws up on the donut, do you want the donut? And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> She offers you a, a cookie, and there are boils all over her hand, and hands and that's oozing all over the cookie. Do you want the cookie? And I'm like, I really want that. <laughs> and it made, me, it made me hungry every time. I was always hungry and hungrier as I went, and I gained weight actually when I was going there. Um, and so, um, uh, so that was very honestly frustrating for my mother. And I, uh, from there, she also was obsessed with the fact that I wouldn't uh, dress. I would wear black all the time, and I would also like steal T-shirts from my dad and paint um, uh, like. like uh, eyeballs on them that were crying bloody tears, and, uh, and, uh, and she so she took me to get my color analysis done so I could see what season I was, to see if I could those blacks that were bringing up you know, something that I need to find out my color so I could get my jaundice undertones to be more pronounced. And so uh, she took me to the, get my swatches done, and I was a spring season, and so I was supposed to be wearing like pastels and oranges and blue and pinks that kind of stuff, and you know which I was like. Rrr. <laughs> and, she, uh, and I was like, I'm not that. I'm my seasons. I'm cold and flu season. I'm not that. <laughs> um, and she, around this exact same time, actually, I started having uh, death anxiety. I don't think it, it wasn't it wasn't right. It wasn't connected with the spring. It wasn't like I'm a spring season. I'd rather be dead. Oh. It wasn't like that. But I'd wake up in the middle of the night and um, would, out of nowhere, would immediately start feeling like I was falling through the center of the earth. Um, I could have just been thirsty, I don't know, it's hard for me to identify my emotions sometimes. But I feel like I was falling through the center of the earth, and before I could stop myself, I would be picturing, um, uh, um, well, I'm trying to picture eternity, which is, it was kind of hard, and I was like, eternity, eternity, oh my God, eternity. And someday, uh, I'm gonna be dead for like a week. There'll be a point in time where I'll be dead for one week, oh my God. And then it'll be like, oh, this is Lauren's, this is the one year anniversary of Lauren's death. And then it'll be like, can you believe Lauren's been dead, dead for 20 years? That's amazing. And then eventually it'll be just, um, who's Lauren? <laughs> <laughs> Awful. So I had to have these um, uh, fantasies. I didn't have to. I was, I was forced to have sexual fantasies. No, it wasn't, it wasn't sexual. I, was, um, I, would have, I would have these um, fantasies uh, these, to help calm me down, to help, you know, I would visualize that um, at first I'd imagine that Ken, a life-size Ken doll appeared in front of me, and he was, and it wasn't sexual, and even though he was naked, I, I, I would just sort of knock on his bum, just knock, knock, and then he would lay next to me until I'd fall asleep, it was so comforting, and that didn't work for very long, I, mean, I think just because of the like, knock, 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 my knuckles are hurt, like, knock, knock, knock. so I stopped doing that, but then uh, the, the fantasy that I went to that always worked, was I would imagine that I was David Bowie's personal assistant. <laughs> you live your life in the songs you hear on the rock and roll radio. And when a young girl doesn't have any friends, that's a really nice place to go. Folks hope you didn't turn out cool, but they had to take her out of school. You little touched, you know, and you baby. Living in a world of make-believe 
the morning that I, um, the morning after he died, and the girl who's working there is like, how you doing today? And I go, I'm surprisingly a little more upset about um, the boy than I thought I would be. She's like, uh, who? <laughs> <laughs> I say, David Boy, she's like, oh, I'm not really familiar with his music. I'm like, oh, you aren't? I'm like, okay, well, don't roll Taylor Swift's lips, Taylor Swift's lips, don't worry, you're fine, she's so fine. And I was still like, oh, how could she not know about that? And then as I was, I was leaving, um, uh, and she, and she calls out, you know, as I'm walking out, she goes, oh, hey, um, I'm really sorry for your loss. I'm like, oh, I know. Then I was like, oh, damn it, you got, you're good people. All right. <laughs> and she's sweet. I, um, do you guys remember the time that there was, there was a story in the news about uh, there was a cat that would go sit on people's, it was an old age home, and this cat would sit on the uh, bed or go be with the people who were um, passing, who were dying, and the cat had this sense of wanting to find the people that needed the comfort. Um, and does it, did, I don't know, that, that was a while ago that story was happening. Um, and at the time, I, my friend and I were like, I think the cat's killing the people. I don't think there's anything to do with it. <laughs> I think the cat sees this thing and just like, he's like, I've been on the, I've been on the evening news in 40 different states. And he's just like, like well, I've got this one. Mm, I help you cross over. Because <laughs> it seemed too, like, convenient. Um, and uh, and I, we, we were, uh, and, and we, I, I would feel awful if I was one of the people in the um, in the home. If you see the cat sort of like coming towards you, you're like, oh no! I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. fine. That, but anyway, so I in high school, um, I was like that cat um, for gay boys. So if a gay boy saw me, if, you know, if I had a little crush on a boy, if I, if I was like, oh my gosh, you, boy, you made me laugh really hard today, Mark. They were like, oh God, I guess I'm gay. Lord, I'm like, <laughs> That's just how you knew. So if I was, um, had my affection towards you. I dated so many um, uh, gay boys that if I had a dime for every time I, I had a, a, a closeted boyfriend, I'd have 80 cents. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'd be, I guess, I had a cat, I'm done, it hasn't quite come out yet. But, um, 
I, uh, uh, and, and I, I had this one, I, but I loved to do it in gay boys. It was so much more fun. It was just, I was just laughing and blow jobs, you know, just like olden times kind of stuff. Just so much fun. And it was never, I mean, our, our big, our common uh, bond was that neither one of us wanted to spend any time with my bond. And, we'll out and, we'll like, and deal. Okay, let's get back to laughing. And, um, and perfect. And we went, and I, my, my dates, my, my, um, my senior year boyfriend was Michael Monono. And uh, Michael Monono was very, I uh, had beautiful cheekbones, very bony esque. And our date night was, he would, he'd be cooking me um, dinner, and he'd make like hummus from scratch. And, and he'd be wearing his mother's dress, and making the hummus. And, we're, and that, there was one in particular that he also, we did art projects, and one of the art projects that um, he made and gave to me was a, it was a toilet seat. And if you lifted up the cover, there was a picture of Woody Allen on the inside. <laughs> and that was hilarious. And we would just, we talk in English accents all evening. And we never, at the end of the night, when it got to the point that maybe there could be some kind of physical affection or whatever, he'd make a big joke about something like, oh no, darling, not tonight, then. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like living in Andy Warhol's factory. It's so weird. And I was glad not to have any, again, I was so glad that I didn't have to get to anything like sexual because it takes forever to take off some, you know, your control top underwear and I roll them down. And like, by the time you get them off, you shove them underneath the, you know, the, the seat of the car, you're sort of like, Oh, it's sexy, not sexy, right? Okay, never mind. See you tomorrow. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Woo. And so, uh, he, and I, but I also had all these friends who were constantly trying to convince me that my boyfriends were gay. And I would be cornered um, in my, in the, in my high school hallways all the time. I was like, uh, hey, Lauren, you know how um, Michael, um, well, people are always screaming fag at him, you know, when he's in the mall. And um, when he's sleeping, and when he's in church, and when I'm like, uh -huh, I know why. I know exactly why they do that. Because they're jealous. This is the first soprano in the history of the choir, and the makeup artist, a ballet dancer. Sitting in a restaurant, he walked by. I seen her call that certain look in your eye. I asked, who's that? You said with a smile, oh, it's nobody. Nobody. Maybe that explains the last few weeks. You called me up, dead on your feet, working late again. I asked you with, you said, oh my God, nobody, okay? Well, you're nobody called today. He hung up when I asked his name. Well, I wonder, does he think?
lot of old white men that are being dragged to the theater in this room. It's almost like a sort of, I don't want to say it's like sex trafficking, so it's a big thing to compare it to. But it's definitely like, it's a big thing, it's a big issue. You know, people are like, and also they, they, they think it's going to be like a good scheduled nap time. They're like, oh, theater day, fantastic. <laughs> the whole time that I was in high school, and he was, um, uh, and his name was Kerwin, and it was so, I don't know, it was so tedious, because he had like a stocky ex-girlfriend that was always bothering us and causing all these dramas. I was like, oh, straight people, well, you guys. And there, I, there was one point where we were parked in front of a, our high school, Kerwin and I, sitting in the car, just talking, doing homework, baby. And, um, and uh, Jill shows up, and she's like out the window, and she's knocking on the window, and, he, and Kerwin's doing, like, rolls down the window, and uh, Jill throws a guinea pig at us and goes, take our baby back! <laughs> because they bought a guinea pig together, and it's like, their baby, you know, sort of man, man, don't worry, we'll get really graphic. But I do think that, um, my vagina, I'm just kidding. No, um, I, well, one, I, I was, I went to college for, uh, for one year, <laughs> and, um, and, and it was an awful year, it was horrible, and I, my, my parents like pulled me out of college, and that's a different show, and I uh, had to stay home then for a year in Indianapolis, which I thought was awful. And I had to live at home, which was awful. And I um, was supposed to work, and, I, and, was, oh, no. and so I got a job um, working in CoCheck, and, and I was doing that for a year until I learned the value of money, and then I get to go back to college. And so I'm gonna act like I'm 10 years old, too. I mean, that seems like a smart thing to do. I'm still like, God, maybe I had to, like, I had to learn the value of money, me. Um, it's not awful. So I, uh, I, was, I was in my CoCheck job at this steakhouse, and I was reading The Tao of Pooh, and <laughs> super into it. And this, uh, this guy, Doug, who worked at the, the restaurant, and he was a waiter, and Doug was 32, I was 19, and we were all, all the people at the restaurant were like, Doug's been a waiter for like five years. Like, wow. Like, he's a man waiter. Like, we hadn't met people like that at that point. Like, and now everybody I know is, but anyway. So he, and he comes over to me when I was reading the Dao and he's like, and he goes, oh, it's so funny you're reading that. I'm, I've always thought of myself as, oh, I'm an Eeyore, right? But uh, I, I'm really a poo. I'm like, oh my god, I'm 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 piglet, but I'm I'm really a poo. <laughs> what will we be betting on? This? What will we be betting? What will we be betting the same bed? What will we be betting? What will we be betting? Oh my god, I was so in love with Douglas. Like, oh, and six months later, we were engaged. We were engaged, and Doug and I decided, we read the prophet to one another to seal the deal. We would like, read, read excerpts to each other, like, let us not eat the entire loaf of bread, but take a, a bite of the loaf and let the other one have some loaf too. Yes, I, I'm paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> let us not eat the end, drink all of the wine in the chalice, but only a sip, and let us not put the sips on that, those other chalices. So anyway, that was a real quote, though. Um, so we decided that Indianapolis was too intense for us, we want to get out of there, we want to move to the mountains, so we can be around air and rocks and breezes, and, and we can play Cat Stevens as loud as we want. So we, we got on Doug's motorcycle, and we rode to the mountains with no helmet. I tried to make it Sunday, but I felt so damn depressed. But I set my sights on Monday. Myself undressed. Oh, I ain't ready for the altar, but I do believe there's time when a woman sure can be a friend of mine. I know my saying, 
I could not think of anything worse that could have happened to me at 19 to get my period on someone's sheets. I was this, um, and nowadays that would be, I would, I would love a day where the worst thing that had happened would be period. <laughs> amazing. I would be, that would be a thrill. I can't wait for that. I, I could give a shit now. I'm just like, yeah, if I just had a day where I'm like, oh, you know, all that happened is I got my period all over their couch. Oh, yeah, I know, but I got a day. It's a turn around for me. And I could give them, like, oh, yeah, here's my period. I thought so. And I thought, oh, Shut the bed. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's not what he's gonna know. And, and I was still like, oh, it's like the Godfather. Where's the, where's the horse's head? Uh. And I was trying to get rid of the sheets, and I was so embarrassed that it was on. I took the sheets off the, the bed, and I was, I was like, what am I gonna do with them? I have to look back. <laughs> and I took them, and I was, I, I was, there was a moment where I was gonna jump out the window, not to kill myself. I was like, but I, but he was only on the third floor, and everything, like, I'm just gonna leave. I'm just gonna break up. I'm just gonna disappear. He'll never see me again, because how can I face him? And, he, and Franz walks in the room, and I'm, taking, and I'm trying to shove his sheets underneath the bed. And he's like, what are you doing? And he grabs the sheets, and he like unfurls them. He's like, oh my god, OK. Ah, I can't wait to do laundry, man, and show everybody I've been with a real woman. Oh my god. When will we be mad in front? When will we be mad? together and six months later we were engaged and oh and I, as soon as we got to Amsterdam we broke up because uh, in Amsterdam you know he was not the the god that he was in Indiana like in Indianapolis little kids would follow him around and just like can I touch him I'm like no 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 you know and they're because he's so tall and so mean and then um and then you get to Amsterdam and they're all like that um just like can I even find you in this sea of tall mean people you're all blind and I went from being sort of this, like, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm so out there, with, like, feminist film studies, and I'm so such a liberal in this, my conservative state. And then I get to Amsterdam, and I'm just like, I think I saw someone's bra strap. <laughs> I can't take it here. You know, I was just so jumpy about how over the top it was there and the, the openness. I saw a little bit more than bra straps. Um, a little euphemism. Um, so we get there, and after we've broken up, I, well, before we broke up, I, I, what happened was that we were at this dinner party, and... A friend of his, uh, Rini Rurich, and uh, Rini was the same person who, when I first got to Amsterdam, had said to me, "Wow, so I'm so curious. What is it you find in our France so so wonderful? Because you know, uh, France always has to go to different countries to find his girlfriends. Yes, the Dutch women want nothing to do with him." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh yeah, well, I'll take him. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know." And then, so it was Rini at this dinner party who uh, says, like in front of everybody, she says, oh, Lauren, oh, no, yeah, I want to tell you, when you were gone last weekend, uh, Franz tried to have sex with me. No, and I told him no. I'm like, oh, okay, well, thanks for telling him no. <laughs> Pass the potatoes. Like, yeah. what? Well, yeah, and I, at that point, I was like, he, and Franz hadn't even, he hadn't even done anything. He just tried to. But even that, I, would, I thought that was always worse. They'd even reject it. I'm like, oh, she didn't even want you. you know, you're, but, I, but the fact that he tried to cheat was, mortifying to me. And again, now that would be just like Tuesday. You're like, nothing. <laughs> no, what are you going to do? We're all animals. We can't help it. Um, but at the time, I was so naive and tender-hearted. And I was, you know, devastated. So I, I broke up with him and got out of there. And, um, oh, my God, you know, speaking of, of, um, of cheating foreigners, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Brady Harris is from Houston, Texas. <laughs> Recap tires. Y'all the reason I'm hanging out clothes outside of wires. Y'all the reason I can't so ugly, little darling. Ugly looks ain't everything. Money ain't everything. But I love you just the same. Well, you're the reason I switched the beer from soda pop. You're the reason I never get to go to the view shop. You're the reason our kids are ugly, little darling. All the looks ain't everything, money ain't everything. But I love you just the same. Guess that we won't ever have everything we need. Cause when we get ahead, we got another mouth to feed. You're the reason my good looks and my figure is gone. 
You're the reason I ain't got no hair left to comb. You're the reason our kids are ugly, little darling. All the looks ain't everything. Money ain't everything. But I love you just the same. Hey, Conway, why in the devil won't you go shave and put on a clean pair of pants one of these days? Take a look at yourself, Loretta. You can take the perlers out your hair, I don't know, maybe put on a little makeup and get out of that house coat by supper sometime, you know? <laughs> well, considering everything I've been through today, Conway, I think I look like a movie star. Yeah, Ruth Buzzy. <laughs> you know what? Fuck you, Brady. Fuck you. Trust a man. I would never open my heart to somebody because of you, so fuck you. <laughs> You're the reason why I, I would go on a date with a polyamorous person because I could give a shit anymore. <laughs> Fine, whatever. Well, gay or wacky, but yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'd, I'd go on a date with some polyamorous uh, freak show in their, in their cardigan and their mushy tongue. <laughs> so when I met my first husband, <laughs> and, uh, I was in Seattle, and uh, Michael was a bartender, and I was, uh, everybody was always saying to me, Lauren, he buys free drinks for everybody. And I'm like, oh, he does? Oh, it seemed different for me. He gives me this when he does it. And they're like, oh yeah, he does that to me too. I'm like, oh, wow, that is similar. I uh, <laughs> felt for him, and he would do this thing where he would always want me to relax. He was always so much relax. I mean, he was holding me, he'd be like, Lauren, just relax. I'm like, I'm relaxed, I'm relaxed. I'd like be hovering my head in his chest. He's like, I'm relaxed. <laughs> And I, I was so sure, I'm like, yeah, right, right, you, you want me to relax. As soon as I relax, you're gonna chop my head off and you're gonna bury it in the backyard. I'm not a sucker. I'm watching you all the time. Eyes, eyes, eyes. You know, like, stick my eye open. Like, I got you. And I couldn't quite ever really, like, oh, relax. Like, I was hoping I would. And the thing that made me fall in love with him was this one little moment where uh, he picked me up, and that was a profound gesture to me, and I don't mean like in his little automobile, he picked me up and he went running down the, um, the sidewalk, and I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm a girl, I'm a light girly flower. And we got married, and we got married on San, I was in San Juan Islands, on Orcas Island, and then we came out of the chapel, and I remember all my friends were like, Lauren, look up, eagle. Eagles, that's such a good sign for you guys. And then we moved to New York City, and that was stressful. And New York can be a little bit on the intense side. And we're, I mean, for the first day I was there, a taxi car went by and it splashed dirty, hot sewer water in my open mouth. And I was like, there's a ah, oh, walk of New York City. And I saw, um, and I saw a, um, a, a wig with throw-up on it. That's another. Okay, um, so we're in New York City, and Michael still is bartender, and he's doing full-time bar, but he's bartending in the evening, he, till 4 a.m. in the morning, that's when the bars close. A little different than here when they close at 7. And so, that's different. different strokes, different folks. I prefer the 7 o'clock. I'm like, good, 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 I got shit to do at home, but thank you. Um, another night, you're saving me at least three or four drinks. Um, so I, uh, I mean, he was bartending in New York, he would come home until 6 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't know he was going to still bartend. For some reason, I thought that was just like a phase or something. And I'm like, you're still gonna do that? That's your thing? And he was like, uh, yeah. I'm like, God, I should have talked to him. <laughs> should have asked him questions. You know, gotten to know him a little bit. Oh well. And here we are, I'm married. So uh, I and I was on the Daily Show, and I was I was well, I was getting fired from the Daily Show. Like from the minute I got the job, it was just a process of slow firing, and it was very stressful. And then I started like, you know, buttons were popping off my clothes again. So I'm just like eating. Ah, uh, the whole that office was like a feedback. I just like put the, the office on my head when I got there. Rah, rah, rah. And you're like you eat all day. And the, the buttons on my, my uh, suit that I used to wear um, were like gapping and gapping and gapping and I could not hold it in. And they were always having to like stop taping something like, stop, stop taping, we got the gap. They'd get electrical tape trying to close the gap in my blouse. And that was, uh, that always made me feel pretty. And, uh, <laughs> the electrical tape is coming undone. Uh, it's a little stressful, but I chose not to talk about that either with Michael. I, I, I never, I never saw him. I never chance. I'm a victim. <laughs> no, I, I had to go see him at his bar. That's the only time I can really uh, see him. And so I, before I go in to visit, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna see Michael at work. I'm, you know, trying to like pump myself up. I'm like, I'm Michael's hilarious wife. I'm Michael's crazy wife. And I walk into the bar, and Michael would be talking to um, a girl sometimes. What do you do? Sometimes girls talk to you. Um, and, he, and, and they'd see me, I'd see both him and the girl both spot me like, oh, 
Why? 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 My lovely wife. Does everybody know my lovely wife? Oh, I'm so, I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you came in, Lauren. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'd sit at the bar and I would watch just this parade of women, women, one after the other, came up to Michael and like, hey, my guy, hey, what? Oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, my gosh, really? Oh, you know, what do you want? What do you want? I said, oh, I don't know. Oh, my God, I don't know. Oh, you're talking to her. Oh, my God, okay. And then they all come over to me. They're like, oh, my gosh, hi. Oh, are you Michael's wife? Like, yeah, that's me. Oh, I've heard so much about you. You're so lucky. I'm like, I know, Michael's very sweet. No, I mean, he talks about you all the time. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. I, I won the husband contest. And no, I mean, we share a cabaret hall every night, and he's always talking to me. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, you share a cab rock? I didn't know you shared a cab. I thought he walked over every night. So I'm sitting there, like, getting all these free drinks from Michael, getting more and more like, uh, drunk. And by the end of the night, I'm like, yeah, Michael's beautiful wife. No, no. <laughs> so I'm out of there. And I decided the, the problem was New York City. I'm like, it's too stressful here. It's too stressful. We got to go. We, we, we got to go to California. And we heard that they'd, they'd um, there, there'd been gold found in the hills there. <laughs> so, we got to get there quick, Michael. Quick, quick, quick. Get your ass. And so, uh, get out. so he went out, but he wanted to go out ahead of me and find um, find a place for us to live. He went to Homestead for us and to get the cattle. He had a room for the cattle and kill off the engines. Um, ride me when it's safe, Michael. Ride me. And so uh, he, he went ahead uh, to find us a place to live. And he packed up the car and he took off and he disappeared for three days and I never heard from him um, again uh, as my husband. Because that next time I heard from him, he, didn't, he told me he didn't want to be married anymore. And so um, I'm trying to think what happened then. Oh yeah, it was over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was such an odd, like, and it was weird to me uh, at the time. Even I never once worried that something um, had happened to him. The three days that I, everyone's like, "Where is he?" I'm like, "I don't know," but I never thought he was dead. So I think I knew secretly that he was sort of like didn't didn't want to hurt my feelings. So instead, he, he was like, "Oh, um, I was gonna." Tell you something. I'll tell you in one second. I'm gonna go get the mail. <laughs> I was like, okay. I guess he probably went to go get the mail. Like, maybe take it off. Maybe at the end of the marriage. But he went, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. So I was like, okay. And I, I was uh, devastated by this, obviously. I, and I was the thing that was so. And my friends were also surprised. Actually, they're like, Lauren, you were like Joan Rivers with him. You were always making fun of him. Like, aren't you a little? Like, no, I wasn't. Like, oh my god. They're like, you were always like, oh, who do you have to fuck in this town to get an orgasm? Apparently not Michael. I'm like, I <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, Lauren, if a dog licked your hand, you were like, if only my husband. I'm like, what? I did that? And they said I always make jokes because he was short, that I was always like, you know, that I would say to him, like, do you want to be my husband? Here he is. And like, that would so awful. Like, and I'm like, I don't remember doing that. And like, but, but still, yet, even though people were saying that to me, I was like, but it doesn't matter. So, so what if I did that? He promised me. He promised me. Like, I was so caught up in the, the vows that we made. I'm like, but he said, it makes no sense. And my friends would invite me to their weddings after that, and I would, um, I would tell them that, yeah, I'd be glad to come to your ceremony of lies. <laughs> and I would sit there at the wedding, just like. <laughs>
did you throw up? You didn't throw up for the show, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I remember this too. Um, I know that we're almost to the intermission, don't worry. Everyone's like, oh, Jesus. Um, I, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, I know that a lot of times people have said to me, oh, well, you know, in your relationships, you mirror, you imitate what you've understood to be love. You know, you're basing it on your parents or whatever. And I thought, God, that probably is true, because my parents have been just like giving each other shit for 53 years. And they're always like, we've been married for 54 years. And just 54 years of just like, don't talk to that crazy one. He's a crazy one. They're always like, Arr. And I was just at home recently visiting, and they're both in their 80s, okay? And like, as soon as my, my dad leaves the room, my mom's like, okay, so, Lauren, you understand that everything he's saying, you gotta take with a grain of salt. He doesn't understand where he is right now. You know? And I'm like, I think he's okay. He's like, oh no, no, he's very disoriented. It's, it's Alzheimer's, you know? He doesn't have Alzheimer's. And I'm like, I don't think it is. Well, not really, but it's coming, you know? It's coming. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, you know? <laughs> And, then, and she's always blaming him for the fact that, like, you know, again, she's like 83, but she's like, I, you know, I could be out there doing something, but this guy's keeping me down. You know, he's out there and he doesn't have those bad knees, Lauren. I'd be going to Hawaii right now, but I can't because of him, you know, because he can't travel well. I can travel. He can't. You know, and then as soon as she leaves the room, my dad's like, whatever she said to you is a lie, okay? Because it's not that. It's her bladder. That's why we can't travel. <laughs> And that's why I just shit talking each other. <laughs> and then they're like, we've been married for 53 years. So, so it does work. Um, I, I wanted to, to share a, a quote before we go to um, intermission for the song that uh, I was watching Dateline um, on TV at the, at the Hotel 43. And uh, there is a quote um, I, that I wrote down when I heard it. I was like, oh, that's good. And um, it was, the reporter goes, uh, let's see, murder and marriage go together like a horse and a carriage. <laughs> He was on his way home from Candletop. Been two weeks gone and he thought he'd stop at Webbs and have him a drink before he went home to her. And he won't love, said hello. He said, I what's new and woe said, sit down, I got some bad news that's gonna hurt. He said, I'm your best friend and you know that's right. But your young bride ain't home tonight. Since you've been gone, she's been seeing that in his voice. But he got mad and he saw a man. And he said, Boy, don't you lose your head. To, to tell you the truth, I've been with him myself. As a night that the lights went out in Georgia. As a night that they hung in his name. So trust your soul and all that. And he got mad and he left the bar Walking on home cause he didn't live far, you see And he didn't have many friends and he just lost him one Brother thought his wife must have left town So he went home and he found the only thing that daddy had left him That was a gun He went off to Andy's house Creeping through the backwoods quiet as a mouse Came across the tracks too small for Andy to make He looked through the screen at the back porch door He saw Andy lying on the floor in a puddle of blood and started to shake. But the Georgia Patrol was making her round, so he fired a shot just to flag him down. A big belly sheriff grabbed his gun and said, Why did you do it? Judge the guilty in a make believe trial, slapped the sheriff on the back with a smile and said, Well, supper's waiting, and all I got to get to it. Got to go feed the slaves. <laughs> That's a lie that the lights were out in Georgia That's a lie that they hold me in and say, man Don't trust your soul and all backwards of the lawyer Georgia, this town's got blood stains on his hands Hey, hold my brother before I could say The tracks that he saw while he was on his way To Andy's house and back that night were mine 
had never left town. That's one body that her never be found. You see, little sister don't miss, but she ain't her good.